wow, I'm really lucky that the world has changed enough that I don't have to focus on like being a woman in a man's world. I can like just be a human in a human's world. <laughs> never really thought of myself as a woman captain. In Clearwater was certainly a good environment where it wasn't particularly pointed out to you what you were or weren't. Oh, that's so cool. You're a woman captain. And it's like, you don't want to have any reaction, really. You don't want to be a woman captain. You just want to be a, a captain. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Amali Knobloch and I am on the board of directors of the Women's Sailing Foundation slash National Women's Sailing Association. Um, and these episodes are uh, even more special for me because I'm also the outreach and engagement manager at Clearwater, whose legacy inspired me to bring this event to life. Um, so I wanted to take this opportunity to thank NWSA, the entire board, and especially the president, Debbie Huntsman, um, for allowing me to take up two nights of programming uh, just to toot the Clearwater horn. If you don't know Clearwater, uh, Clearwater was launched in 1969 as a beacon of the Hudson Valley to raise awareness about the environmental conditions of the river that we still sail on today. Since then, through 50 years of public programming, almost 500,000 people have crossed the deck of the sloop, many of whom's first direct interaction with the, with the river took place on board with the captains and the crew. Clearwater's legacy lives on in each one of our speakers, and so we're excited to bring you tonight's group. And as an added bonus, we will be bringing back our three speakers from last week to join us at the end of the Q&A. Uh, tonight, in honor of Women's History Month, we are gonna celebrate these three women's legacy, Captains Joya Blix, Sam Hicks, and Amy Nelson. There's something special about the Clearwater community with a storied past of female or female presenting leadership from the sloop all the way up to the board. Knowing how tough it can be a woman aboard any vessel, let alone a tall ship, we thought it important to share the stories of the women who belonged and led this community relatively free from many of the negative experiences or disappointing behaviors that many of us still experience on boats today. Our first speaker is going to be Joya, who first came to Clearwater as an apprentice in 1986 um, and who served as captain from 1997 to the year 2000. Um, who now enjoys renovating their home and still drives boats um, even today, um, picking up, you know, odd jobs and, and doing the things that still really bring her joy. Getting out on the water is something that even those of us who um, have retired uh, still want to come back to. So thank you, Joya, for being here. I'm going to turn my spotlight off and turn your spotlight on. Hey everybody, um, I'm Joya and I've sailed with a lot of folks who are probably on right now and, and hi. Um, I uh, wanted to talk tonight about pumpkin sale or pumpkin festival and I kind of use those two terms interchangeably. Um, pumpkin festival went on until about 2001 or 2002 and it was a two week festival that we would start up in Albany or Rensselaer, um, which is as far north as the, as the Clearwater can get because of low bridge there. So we'd start all the way up north there and we'd kick it off with a weekend festival for two days. We would have pumpkins. We'd load up the, the deck of the Clearwater with pumpkins. Um, you can see in that picture there where we would get rid of the extra life jackets and some other gear and we'd load up with pumpkins. And we'd start our festival up there and we would start with uh, open to the public for the weekend. We'd be selling pumpkins. We would have uh, a stage set up all day long with performances. We would also have stone soup. And uh, yeah, it was kind of hard to get the pumpkins to the boat sometime. You can see in that picture, we're actually rowing them out. But normally, fortunately, we were able to form long pumpkin lines to get them to the boat. Um, so we'd have a lot going on for a weekend festival to start. We'd have an evening concert in whatever venue we could get, um, sometimes more professional venues, sometimes 
volunteer fire department or whatever we could find. We do an, so we'd have an informal education program on shore on the weekends um, and open to the public. On the weekdays, we'd do something totally different. We would have students, a lot of students that couldn't necessarily come on clear water would come on the weekdays. Uh, you'd see little kids coming down, you know, little tiny ones that couldn't go out on an education sale because they weren't old enough. And we would have groups coming all day long with our more formal education program, plus visiting the boat, plus buying pumpkins, plus entertainment. So it was a lot going on, plus stone soup. Probably a lot of folks already know the story of stone soup. And uh, the kids would bring vegetables for the next day's stone soup. So that was a way of kind of connecting the communities together. Another way we had of connecting the communities together is, oh, we'd go from one port to the other to the other. We'd have a different port every day, pretty much, um, doing this uh, education program and in this festival on weekends. The folks from the first port would send on a gift to the next port, to the officials from the next port. So we would, Clearwater would be taking a gift from one port to the next. And then the last, uh, last port of the whole two weeks would be somewhere in the New York Harbor area. We would get a gift at the end of the season there or the end of the two weeks to bring back up to the north. Um, it took a lot of people to make Pumpkin Festival happen. We would have the different sloop clubs would be involved helping us in the ports that they could help us in. And we'd have the ferry sloops, the Woody Guthrie and the Sojourner Truth and their crews um, for wherever they could make it, as much of the pumpkin festival as they could to help on. We'd have five um, volunteers on board that were kind of specialized volunteers who'd been crew before at some point, so they didn't require any training. We'd also have five performers living on board. And the performers, musicians, storytellers, we would have a jester regularly, otherwise known as Roger the Jester. Oh, and there's a picture of T Toshi with a stone for stone soup. Um, so we had a lot going on, a lot of people involved, a lot of community involvement where we'd have people just from the local community would know about it and would come down and help us get it set up because it was like setting up a, a circus every day basically with all that was going on. So it was a really a great program. Really a lot of fun. It was exhausting for everyone. We had, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 concerts during the two weeks. So it was quite exhausting for the crew. The crew had to hot bunk it, meaning that they would sign up for days and nights off. And um, when they signed up for a night off, they lost their bunk. Somebody else would be sleeping in their bunk that night, which also meant that somebody on board would be switching bunks every night. Um, for a new place to sleep. And this was all in the fall uh, because it was a pumpkin festival and uh, sometime in October. It varied a, bit, a little bit about when in October. Um, so it was a really great thing that we used to do and we really enjoyed it. Oh, and there's uh, one of our crew who's stirring up the stone soup happily. And stone soup was just great because it meant, you know, if it was a cold October, you could just get soup whenever you wanted. You didn't have to bother the cook or anything. It was also very inexpensive for the school groups. We, in the beginning of my time period, it was free to the school groups. And then in later years, it was $25 or $50 for a school group. So it was also a very affordable program for, clear, for participants for Clearwater. But there were a lot of folks helping out. Thank you so much, Joya, for telling that story. I think pumpkin sale is one of those things that we all hear about today, but uh, there's so many of us that never really experienced it. And it's something that people um, really share all of the time as one of their favorite memories. And, um, you know, it's something that we're looking at, at getting back to because, you know, it really was this opportunity for people to come together, um, for everyone in the entire valley to unite and to support um, their water and, and everything that we do. Our next speaker is going to be Sam Hicks. Uh, Samantha, aka Captain Sam, started working on the sloop as an apprentice in 1994 at the very beginning of what would become a 17-year uh, career in sail education. 
She worked her way up through the ranks on numerous vessels, um, including the schooner Ernestine out of New Bedford, ooh, who just, I think, got their first woman captain, sailing as a chief mate for the maiden voyage of the brigantine Irving Johnson, and sailing to both Europe and Asia aboard the Pride of Baltimore too. After sailing as the captain of the sloop from 2000 to 2005, she signed on as chief mate on the Picton Castle's fourth world voyage, circumnavigating the globe. And if you don't know Sam, um, she is also on the board of Clearwater. Um, so we're really excited to hear from her. Okay, thank you, Amali, and thank you, uh, thanks to everybody who put this together and everybody who showed up. Just for clarity, right? I'm not a captain anymore. In fact, it's like the opposite. Uh, I have two little kids who don't listen to me anymore, uh, except for some nights uh, when I'm not totally wrecked. Um, I will recite poems for bedtime. And the one that comes up the most is Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken. Okay, we all know that one. Um, and that's what this is about, right? I could add reams to what everyone said about the importance of Clearwater's welcoming culture and community. Um, I'll probably touch on pumpkin sale, <laughs> um, but I'm actually gonna be a bit selfish and make it about me. I, I tend to do this, like when I, uh, as captain, I would sometimes threaten folks uh, to take off their Yankees hats when they stepped aboard if they got mouthy. Uh, that didn't have to do it too much. Uh, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, it turns out that I do have a habit of uh, putting myself into situations that are outside my comfort zone. It is hard and it's terrifying, but it has led me here. Um, I shouldn't be here, not really. Um, by all rights, I should be a teacher. Uh, my dad thinks I would have made a great politician. Uh, where I'm from, kids did not grow up and go to sea. Uh, like Captain Cronin, I did not grow up in a sailing family. Um, though in an odd twist, my parents spent their honeymoon on the Stephen Tabor in 1961. And uh, I did not know about semester at sea when I was a teenager. I didn't even know about my own state's tall ship, the magnificent Ernestina that we've talked about, uh, who's, about who's getting a new lease on life. Um, but as a teenager, I did know one thing, and that was that I didn't like people making assumptions about me, pigeonholing me. Um, I didn't realize how important that concept would become until I really embraced it and then found a way to pass it on. And I really, I blame my twin brother. It's really all, all his fault, my twin brother Lee. Um, I dropped him off in Philadelphia uh, on a big square rigger named Gazella. They were sailing from New Orleans to Phil, nope, from Philadelphia to New Orleans and back. Uh, and I was dying to join them with zero, zero experience. Um, to my excitement and horror, um, I learned that I would be able to do that thanks to my brother and a big leap of faith from Captain J.B. Smith, uh, who said it was okay, they needed a body. Uh, and I flew down on Thanksgiving day, 1983, and thankfully Captain J.B. Smith, not to be confused with Captain Cindy Smith, um, like many sailors is a bit superstitious. Uh, it is bad luck to depart on a Friday. And so I had one whole day to learn the rig of Gazella, about 13 sails, if I remember, over 180 lines. Um, I remember doing a pin chase, uh, which we can talk about later, uh, with my brother and some of the illustrious Zimmerman boys, uh, that, that might sound familiar. 14 days at sea around Key West, and I was completely hooked. That is when the Clearwater community sprang into action. Several folks on board, including those Zimmerman boys, uh, recommended Clearwater as a way to keep sailing, work with kids, gain experience. Uh, gain experience, indeed. Now, before getting on Clearwater, I did do a short stint as a deckhand up in Maine with a moderately sexist captain who literally told me, quote, I was not in this business for the long haul. He called me a fly-by-nighter. That was not going to stand. Uh, I got myself onto Clearwater as an apprentice, we've heard this before, sailing during the busiest, craziest time of the sailing season, that would be pumpkin sail, uh, with an all-star captain and crew, you know who you are, um, throngs of enthusiastic volunteers for, for that pumpkin sail. That captain, by the way, was Betsy Garthwaite, and I was terrified of her. Uh, in the middle of this beautiful controlled chaos, the mate, Cindy Smith, sound familiar people, uh, she put me in charge of a big chunk of volunteers for a task that I genuinely thought I had no business running. And I saw it in the comments, it was the truck. It was all about the truck. 
Um, but was I going to say no to Cindy Smith? No. So I did it. We succeeded. And I went on to the next task. That nerve wracking feeling of pushing boundaries came back so many times, especially when I was Nate and Captain Blix and uh, the late relief captain and shipwright, the legendary Don Tao would say five words to me. You're going to dock today. Joy would sit there on the rail with an amused but watchful look while I worked it all out without panicking. And Don would just stand nearby with this look of pride that was contagious. So in 97, I got my first Coast Guard license and celebrating in, uh, in Boston in a little Italian restaurant around the corner uh, from the exam center. This was in Boston's North End. My mother, who was a Brooklyn girl, <laughs> who was skeptical, or born and raised in the city, skeptical, but always supportive, said to me, what now? Like, what do you plan to do with this license? There's a better accent than that. I earnestly replied, very earnestly replied, said, I'd like to work on creating a tall ship program for teenage girls to help them start to see what they are capable of. And three years later, there she was, the brilliant educator, Allie Beiser, uh, with the wisdom and skill to put together our first young women at the helm, a program that has now lasted almost 20 years and has expanded to include young men at the helm and LGBTQ youth. It is absolutely brilliant. And we will, in fact, revisit uh, the youth empowerment programs. Here's the thing about pushing boundaries. The fear, it's easier to manage when you have people around you supporting you. In the hierarchy of a ship, my apologies, in the hierarchy of a ship, sometimes that's a captain who mentors you, and sometimes it's the crew you build for yourself when you take the helm. And I remember our, my first emergency jibe near midnight under the Bear Mountain Bridge, coming around that real tight turn, just executed flawlessly by the mate, Ellen Ivanko, sparks flying from the main sheet traveler. And mate, Esther Whitmore, very calmly managing a passenger evacuation off Indian Point after we Caught a, caught a buoy in the prop. And in the middle of it, a young student, bless his little heart, managed to get his finger stuck in a hole in the centerboard crane case. Started panicking. She got it done. These professional mariners enabled me to be a better captain. Uh, just to be the captain who looks at my first mate and says, you're going to dock today. And I'd just like to take a moment um, right now to remember the look of excitement and trepidation on the face of another mate who is no longer with us. Uh, as I told her, she would run the wholesale that day. Um, we did lose the late Liz Stroney about six years ago and it was far too soon. And she would have been, and did go on to have some time as a, as a master herself. So moving on, I, I take this time not to look just at the kind of the warm welcoming nature of the community, uh, but at what it's capable of producing. Um, and, and Betsy, if you're here, I can tell you with near certainty, that kid that you convinced to take a chance so many years ago, he did learn a lot about himself and what he can handle, that he can handle more than he ever thought he could. Uh, a story that I, I'll wrap up soon, but a story that captures us all perfectly is from, I don't know, Allie can correct me, our second or third young man at the helm, getting ready to strike sail, end of the day, head back to Poughkeepsie, and the engine wouldn't start. Timing is everything. So we were able to sail right over to that little sliver of a cove on the east side of the river, right off Marist, outside, outside the channel, and drop the hook in time to avoid a very large northbound bulk carrier. And the engineer, Maddie Oates, comes up on deck and tells me that the set screw for the governor is sheared up. We have to order a new one. We're not driving anywhere. So a call to our good friends at Mid Hudson Seato. We get a push back in with CETO giving power, but still having the students steer using the tiller, right? Great tool for the job. Get the whole rig back, back to the dock. At the debrief the next day, we, we read all the evaluations that the students have written out about their experience. And in response to the question about their favorite part of the program, the answer was almost universal. It was actually the unplanned emergency situation where we had to drop anchor and get towed back. They, they said they were scared, but they were excited and confident. And, and there it is, right, right in a nutshell, what you are capable of, you just don't know. So that's the supportive community we have is combined with the professional shipboard expectations, the real-time experiences, 
it enables people to own who they are, to step into themselves and go beyond. It got this little Jewish girl from the Boston suburbs to a 500 ton ocean master license sailing around the world as chief mate in the Picton Castle. It helped create Clearwater's youth empowerment program, gave me the career of a lifetime teaching students from the deck of uh, that sloop. Uh, much to my mother's surprise and like the relief, it even helped me find a husband and build a family. After 17 years in the industry, it uh, helped me prove that old captain in Maine wrong too. Clearwater totally, completely enabled me and so many others here to take the road less traveled by, right? And that, that really has made all the difference. So thank everybody. Thank Joya, thank, thank Pete, Toshi, and everybody I see scrolling by. Thank you so much, Sam. I, I really appreciate it. Um, it was really wonderful having you um, be able to come and, and talk to us. And our next speaker is going to be Amy Nelson. Uh, Captain Amy led the Sloop Clearwater in its most recent and transformative 2020 season as experiential education turned virtual. In addition to the Sloop, Amy has captained marine science expeditions on the Salish Sea and research vessels off of the coast of Maine. Amy earned a degree in marine biology from UNCW and then spent the early years of her career sailing internationally in the Western Pacific and the Caribbean Sea. Currently, Amy is advancing her merchant mariner credentials in the deck and engine room departments, utilizing a career development grant for women in non-traditional fields, awarded to her by the American Association of University Women. Amy plans to use these advanced certifications to further her career as a captain. So I'm really excited to hear from Amy, who I can also say is a friend. Really special to see something like this happening. Um, virtually entirely um, based on the fact that Clearwater essentially used to be the vessel that brought people out in the water and, you know, hands-on education. It's a very different um, platform, which we're utilizing and still being really successful at. And it just makes me really happy. My story starts um, with these two pictures. Um, well, the picture on the left actually is the first one. Um, I came to the Clearwater as an engineer. Um, I had already had multiple years experience on um, various small private vessels. Um, and I came in really excited to be finally working for a vessel that had a mission I believed in. And it was protecting waters that um, as a local to the Hudson Valley growing up in this area, um, protecting the waters that I really associate very strongly with as home. Um, and as the engineer, I, I did a full calendar year nonstop and did a couple other seasons on and off, nagged and asked and begged captains to let me dock the boat. Um, I wasn't the mate, um, uh, so I didn't have the same stories that Sam had where the captain kind of hands you the helm. I had to kind of weasel my way in there and constantly, um, luckily the captains were very willing um, to, uh, and the mates were very willing to allow me to um, get the experience docking in the intense currents of the Hudson River, um, which are unique to themselves. And it allowed me to take the picture on the right, which is um, me captaining as relief captain um, for a young woman at the helm. Um, these two pictures, despite looking nearly identical, um, were actually taken almost three years apart from each other. Um, <laughs> so they were not happening back to back. And I would say as the engineer and then the captain, neither of these roles did I ever feel I was looked at from, the, from outsiders of the Clearwater community as being a traditional fit for um, filling. Uh, my time, as the captain during the Young Women program, um, it is safe to say it was nearly, a, it was a complete dream come true. Um, everybody at this point has heard about all the different um, magical experiences that Clearwater gives people and how um, special it is to be on board and educating students. Um, and this was just a really special one for me um, as the captain on the boat. Um, each one of these women in this photo really um, taught me more about myself maybe than I even taught them by the end of the week. It was, um, you know, we all taught about 
each other about how strong we are as individuals, um, the resilience that we have and um, the strength we can exhibit and pass on to others. It was really a magical experience. And, but the Clearwater had two captains at this time and um, I remained in contact and was available. And then in October, um, 2019, I got a phone call that I was needed as a captain and I was so ready. I was ready to go. We were getting, the boat was getting ready to haul out in Albany. They needed a captain to do it. And I was, it was an insane task to just jump right into um, a haul out period as the only captain with a crew of a few people I knew, most people I didn't know, um, none of which I hired, but I was all in. I just went for it. I jumped, dove right in. And this photo here is what I expected. This is what I was doing the haul out period for. This is what I was gonna go through the entire winter of maintenance to get to this photo. All these students crammed on the starboard side of the deck in one spot while the crew is probably doing coil down or whatever they're doing. And seeing the faces of all of them step on board for the first time, convincing that kid like Betsy spoke of to get on board when they didn't want to. Um, convincing the kids who didn't want to leave to leave because they had to go and spread the knowledge that they got to the rest of their um the people that they knew whether it be their cat or their family members um so the anticipation of this moment was what really got me to dive in as quickly as i did that anticipation of being part of something so incredible um is what got me so willing was made me so willing um so the winter season started and it was going great. We did a ton of maintenance. Um, the boat was scheduled for maintenance um, in 2020, 2021. So we were getting to all the little nooks and crannies. We were varnishing everything. We were stripping everything of repainting all the surfaces. We got a huge paint donation and we're repainting all the surfaces. And I was coming in with all this new energy. Um, I wasn't burnt out. I was excited. We were planning all sorts of programming, all these incredible things. Amali and I were de we were determined to get the boat back to Long Island Sound. Um, it was going to be Long Island Sound or bust. And I remember Nick being like, "If you all can, if you want, if you can make it happen, it should happen. And if anybody's going to do it, you all will." And we were excited and we were willing. Um, a huge grant allowed the entire main hold of ballast to get replaced with lead, which I think is a project that's been on people's mind for a decade, a decade maybe. Um, these are iron sash weights. They just rust and flake off into the bilge, clogging all the limber holes, making it really hard to pump the boat out um, and pump all the bilge out. And we used volunteers and the crew members that we had, well, we had kind of bulk crew members, um, to slowly get these weights up on deck. We, it was a really exciting project that we were gonna do throughout the winter. Um, we had open boats. I, the, the picture before this show, um, had a huge open boat, a huge picture of the barn where there's a ton of people um, that none of which were crew members. They were all volunteers for um, a volunteer day. We had open boats with a ton of people in and out. I mean, the winter was, the, was not really what you see anymore these days but we had a huge turnout left and right. Um, and then in March, 2020, I, uh, I don't think I have to really say what happened. I think everybody here probably knows. This picture means a lot to me, actually. It, uh, it kind of encompasses a lot. The boat on the far left, you can see is kind of still covered with its winter cover. Um, and there's very few people in that bow net and all of them are in masks. And it was the opposite of what any of us expected. Definitely the opposite of what myself um, coming on in October of 2019 expected. Um, so the world shut down, and the, but the boat didn't. We kind of spent a few days staring at each other wondering what to do. Um, I actually was out of town when it happened and it was kind of crazy communicating with people on the phone and I had to quarantine before coming back to the boat. But then once finally getting back to the boat, the silence kind of ended. 
we all looked at each other and we knew exactly what we had to do. Um, the haul out period that I did um, up in Albany was a Coast Guard inspection and it had to be done, it had to be completed in what in the water. And if the boat was going to be able to sail at all um, with passengers, which at that time we didn't know if we'd be able to or not, um, we had to pass it. We had to pass the Coast Guard inspection. And this normally is not supposed to be such a strong feat passing a Coast Guard inspection. The clear water should pass with flying colors pretty regularly. Every two years is the hull inspection. You do the annual inspections every year. It's not this amazing thing to pass the Coast Guard inspection. What was the incredible thing is how we did it with so few people in such strange circumstances. So first, we so we all looked at each other and we decided we were just gonna get to work. We we're gonna do it, we we're gonna make it happen. And we had to first reinvent the wheel. How are we gonna reach out to people in this new virtual world uh, that we knew very little about? People had their phones. Um, I wasn't very, I'm not very active on my Instagram. I had no idea these, you know, I was a captain. I wasn't a social media marketing person. Um, and this is a picture of the mate at the time, staring at the big whiteboard, wondering, you know, what is our schedule gonna look like now that all of it got wiped clean? Um, over a hundred ed sales were just completely canceled in the first three months, not to mention how many could have happened um, after that. And we just, we had to figure it out. Uh, the Clearwater is normally a boat that brings everybody together. And I feel like we've all been saying this a lot this past year. Um, so how do you take a vessel that brings everybody together? What, what do you do with a vessel that's so good at bringing people together when everybody's being asked to stay apart? So we got to it, we made a plan. And the community support that we got as soon as we asked for it was incredible. We were being given meals, we were fully cooked meals. We were being given provisions. Um, our cook put a list out of things and food was just flooding to the boat, more food that we can eat in the time. Um, people were giving donations directly to the boat. It was, an, it was really an incredible time of the community showing up. Um, and you're gonna see a lot of the same faces in all these photos. Um, at this point um, in these photos, all these people are volunteering. Um, they had been full-time workers in the, um, for the winter season, and we couldn't continue um, paying them. So their positions completely changed from winter workers to sailing season workers, and um, they all started volunteering entirely, um, which was also a community and um, support that I'll never forget. Um, and it's all the same faces you're gonna see in all these photos. So then it was time for the cover to come off. We had to set, we had to pass this Coast Guard inspection. So we set the sail. I mean, we figured out how to get a sail. That normally we have a volunteer day where everybody comes and puts the sail on their shoulders and walks it. I'm sure every, lots of people in this chat have been part of this experience of bringing the sail onto the boat, but we had to do it with five to six people and we figured it out. I mean, we were working full, I mean, eight to eight, if not eight to 10 um, days in the rain uh, using, luckily we had a lot of very savvy sailors um, and using a lot of mechanical advantage to make things happen. Uh, we used the anchor burton to get this, the mainsail actually onto the boom. Um, from the shore after rolling it down a ramp. Um, it was a crazy experience. And not to mention all of that ballast that was sitting on the deck that all of a sudden those five to six people had to get back into the boat. So we had to go through a frantic experience of weighing ballast, all those sashways ballast and replacing it with lead um, pound for pound. And it was literally a backbreaking experience, but not a single time was there even a complaint. Nobody was even complaining about the work they were doing. Um, everybody was happy to be in a safe spot, um, that they were able to shelter in place. They were able to work from home. They had something to keep their mind off what was happening in the world. Um, 
things were crazy, but there was no complaints. Um, this picture was taken, I think at uh, maybe 9 p.m. I'd argue maybe it was 10 p.m. Maybe it felt like 10 p.m., but um, this was a late, late night that we were all still putting ballast into the boat. Um, and the cover was still on because the time schedule was such that we had to get all this done and get the cover off to be able to pass this Coast Guard inspection. We were pinching every single minute, every single hour. Um, the deck um, that earlier in the photos was uh, all torn apart. Um, this is it part of the way done and it had to be done before the Coast Guard inspection, obviously. Um, and it went from this stage to finished uh, probably in less than a week. Um, and it was pitched until 3 a.m. one evening because there was rain coming, um, which maybe others have had experience doing as well. <laughs> Um, and the crew was just exhausted. I mean, we were every, like I've said time over and over, every minute we were expiring all of our energy. We were running on fumes, but we also had such a uh, important thing to be working towards and an important organization and mission um, to be working for. And uh, we went out and like I said, passing a Coast Guard inspection should not be this incredible thing, but we felt like gods. I mean, it was so intense to get it, to get the boat ready. Um, and we didn't stop there. We kept sailing. We um, started this trip in Albany and decided we were going to sail from Albany to New York uh, with the Arbor River Connexus program. And adapted to this virtual world the best that we could. And it uh, ended up being quite an incredible thing. And I mean, this, this crew, these faces that you're seeing um, in the celebration, uh, they were the winter crew. They were, like I've mentioned, they were remaining there because we were sheltering in place. Um, all the entire spring crew, if I don't know if anybody's on here right now, we had to let tell them all not to come. We had to let everybody go. They're supposed to come for the spring crew. Um, and it, that was also a devastating experience for me when that first happened, um, essentially canceling the spring season. Um, but we didn't cancel it. Like I said, we kept going. We didn't stop. We um, there's a lot of vessels who didn't do what we did this year, and the Clearwater was active on the river and sailing um, all year, all year. Um, and the next photo in Albany um, of us sailing is, uh, I was told I was pretty crazy to go up to Albany as, and uh, set full sail and decide to sail around. There's not much river up there. And um, this picture, I think, is pretty cool because I we are, in fact, under full sail. The engine was on for most of it, but this happens to be a time in which we were sailing south and the engine was not on. Um, so that was at least a, a little magical uh, moment early in this journey. And we sailed all the way down to New York and did it actually twice within the year. And despite the fact that we didn't have all those students that I anticipated having and what I expected my clear water season to be as the captain. Um, there were still so many magical things that happened. And I think it's pretty clear that Clearwater has dealt with a lot of tragedies and a lot of um, hard times. And no matter what, they've gotten through it and they have accomplished amazing feats. And that's through all these stories that all these women have told, I think that's really clear. Um, this past year, that was so obvious to me. And I just want to thank everybody who supported us. I really hope everybody continues to support the organization um, in any way that they can. Right now, volunteering is not really an option. <laughs> um, I mean, it, in the upcoming season, it can be, but um, financially, the organization needs support, donations, a small amount can help. Um, if everybody gives a little bit, it can turn into a lot. And I really hope that um, 
everybody feels inspired to give a little bit because this boat time and time again keeps going and keeps inspiring and is the reason the Hudson River is able to have windsurfers, is able to have people swimming in it, is able to have a safe ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem. Um, there was a news story about dolphins back in the river. There's whales in the river. These things are because the Clearwater um, has made it the, what it is today. So um, please support and thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Um, as you know, I mean, obviously we have worked together and so, you know, how much I love and support you and, and feel your support and, and know how much you love um, the organization. Um, so now we're gonna move into our Q&A session and I'm going to ask um, Amy and Joya a question that um, I think Sam covered when she was speaking, which is, how did you uh, first come into contact with Clearwater? Um, and Joy, if you would like to go first, I'd love to hear from you. Um, how did you first find out about Clearwater and what made you join? Um, I was laid off from my position at a, uh, at a, a marina for the winter. And I was looking through a book called The Whole Earth Catalog. And there were a bunch of boats listed. I knew I wanted to do something boatish. And um, Clearwater wrote back saying, yeah, sure, come up and do winter maintenance. And that was probably in about 81. And then I just didn't get back for five years to sailor. So I saw her first under winter maintenance for a month. And Amy, how about you? How did you first come to Clearwater? Um, I found myself back in my home state of New Jersey um, after sailing internationally. And my good friend who actually works for the Rockaway or used to work for the Rockaway Water Alliance um, recommended that I check it out. And I was like, oh, that boat, I know that boat. Um, my grandma actually has a story of like going to a Pete Seeger concert with some of her Norwegian relatives um, when he was raising money to build the boat. Um, she's still alive and is 93. Um, but uh, so I applied and I remember being so nervous. I'm like, oh my gosh, what if they don't, this is like the perfect mission, perfect location, everything's so perfect. Um, and they were doing the 15, 16 restoration and um, Alethea replied and was like, come up to the boat and check it out. And I um, was a short drive away down New Jersey. So I went up and I thought I was like interviewing and then um, one of the crew members were like, oh, so they told us you're the new engineer. And I'm like, oh, oh I don't even know if I have a job yet, but that's really exciting. Um, and then the, the rest is history. Once I started as the engineer, I was around for over a year, <laughs> multiple seasons. Um, there was another very specific question for you in the chat um, about that grant you got. Um, to continue education. So if it's available, um, would you be willing to post any of that information in the chat or a link to where people can learn more about it? Um, or if it's not readily available, I can include it in the follow-up email that will go out to everyone. I will get a link right now and post it in the chat, but um, oh. it's the, yeah, I'll post it in the chat right now. So Sam, coming to you, I would love to hear um, a little bit more about um, what about Clearwater and what about the community may have made you or influenced you to come back year after year um, and that has you still involved with the organization today. Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, again, for sure, the community, especially for somebody who, you know, it, did, it didn't necessarily come naturally. I grew up, there were some sailors where I grew up and it was a different kind of a crowd, I'll say that. Um, and so to be able to learn, right, I, I will learn anything from anybody who wants to teach me. And there are some places where you go and you say, hey, can you teach me this? And they're like, you know. Um, and there, there were parts of the story that I, that, you know, I cut and edited, but I've had, you know, the sort of like 
people looking down their nose at me like, you can't learn that. Or, um, you know, definitely, definitely people saying, yeah, you're never going to get that. And you know that, that, you know, that, like, that's not, it's not fun. Um, and it's also not productive, right? I, I will learn what you teach me and I will do it until I get it right. And so initially Clearwater was a place where I, it was like, you could be a sponge um, and you could learn so much so fast. And then um, being able to get past the initial sort of trepidation again, like when we were talking about this, I sort of equated it to the parents who teach their kids how to swim by pushing them off the dock, <laughs> um, which seems kind of bad. Um, but they know that they know what you're capable of. So I, I never looked at Joy and was like, "Why are you doing this to me?" Um, maybe once in a while, um, but mostly it was like, "All right, well, she thinks I'm gonna do it. I better, I better do it." Um, and so, so to do these hard things when you know that it's might not be a soft landing, but it's it's you're going to be able to learn something from it, and not in that sort of mean, getting yelled at way, getting belittled way, and that made a difference because I have sailed with that experience as well, and our way is a little more pleasant and productive, right? You you um, part of why I came back was I I learned a lot of what of how to be a captain by seeing by what not to do. So I, I saw other captains elsewhere doing things that I thought, okay, when I'm captain, I'm not gonna do that. That's not how you treat your crew. That's not how you manage people. Um, and it stood me in very good stead when I got back to Clearwater and enabled me to, to, to be, be, with the pe be with my people and, and kind of grow, grow into that kind of management style and, and the kids, right, the kids. I had a, a young a, a graduate of, I don't know, fourth young woman at the home who looked at me and said, God, you must have been so good at science, you know, and, I'm, and math, and you know, I'm terrible. I, and I, I was like, no, don't, don't let those things, don't let those things cl close you in. So it's, it, it's all those things kind of wrapped up. Yeah. I actually have another question for you, Sam, because you mentioned it during our interview, um, and I thought it was so interesting about, you know, the kind of the resilience of not just the Clearwater community at large, but the captains and the crew, and that was about sailing after 9-11 um, and, and how you were able to kind of make it through that experience and, and what, you know, it meant for Clearwater to still be sailing uh, during well, that's definitely one of those moments that I thought Amy said something about how she, you learn from the students and young women at the helm, like as crew, they're teaching you. And that was one of those moments where really the adults needed the kids. <laughs> like, yes, they needed us to keep them safe and, and like not fall overboard or get injured, but mostly we needed them to do the thing that those kids do, who was Betsy talked about magic, right? And so we're in the middle of this horrible tragedy for a little while. JC Parker and I were switching that day and I was driving down from Boston and I changed course driving a couple of times because we at first thought we were gonna, I was gonna have to go further down river that we were gonna be part of an evacuation plan. And it became clear that we were not. And so they go back up, I change course, um, get off I-84 and come back north. and. You know, we switch off and we talked about whether or not we should cancel or keep sailing. And we decided to sail with the kids we had booked the next day. And, you know, it was miraculous. All the adults were just devastated. And the kids, you know, they kind of knew, maybe, maybe they knew, but they just did the thing that they do when they, you know, they hoist a 3,000 pound sail and they think they're Superman, Superwoman. Like, and they were, you know, they're ogling the fish and touching the hog chokers and pushing the tiller and fascinated by everything. And we forgot ourselves. Uh, we forgot what happened for, you know, six hours that day. And I don't know what we would have done without that. We would have, we would have fallen down the hole and those kids kept us out of the hole. It was amazing, the kids. It's magic, just like Betsy said. Awesome. On mute every time. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I can only imagine um, what that must have been like, but you know, I can only give my heart, you know, out to to those of who were adults at the time, because I was obviously a child, but, you know, who were able to, you know, persevere and like press through that, like such traumatic experience, especially I know for New Yorkers, um, state and city alike. Um, so, you know, I think that was a really important thing um, for you to share. I'm gonna ask Joya one more question and then I'm going to add Betsy and Kate into this group so we can talk to them a little more. Um, in that same vein that we were just talking uh, with Sam about, I wanted to ask you if there was anything um, that you learned uh, on the clear water, either as captain or on the crew um, that influenced you later in life, or you found that you had picked up a skill um, that you didn't know uh, applied literally um, to something, but, but what, how did Clearwater kind of influence you uh, later on? Well, I mean, Clearwater, I guess it is literal, is Clearwater was the first chance I had commanding a boat of any size. Um, but it, a lot of patience, just that I needed a lot of patience and to give a lot of patience really is what, I guess what I learned um, and that everybody has something to contribute. We had an emergency on board the boat at one time, uh, well, more than one, as I'm sure all the other captains feel, um, but one that comes to mind um, where a, um, a crew member was very close to getting very badly hurt, but didn't, thankfully. Um, and the, the least trained person on board the boat kind of did the most important thing at the right moment. And it just kind of drove it home to me, you know, about not judging a book by its cover and just, you just don't know who the, the most important, you know, who's going to be doing the most important thing on board. Um, who's got what someone has to give to you or what someone has to give to the situation. can't hear anything. It's me. It's me. I'm the person, you know, we think it's going to be everyone else, but it's me. Um, I, I, you know, I think that's such an important story to share about, you know, everyone's value and their um, influence on each other, you know, in the crew and in life and, and why um, those experiences that we have on board, you know, translate so much um, into our, into our lives. I mean, I am someone who very uh, literally feels like uh, being on boats changed who I am as a person um, for the better. Um, and so, you know, it's really important for me to hear um, those kinds of stories. Um, I'm gonna ask now that everyone transitioned to gallery view so we can see all of these wonderful faces here. I've added Betsy and Kate to the panel. Um, and I wanted to go now to the Q&A box because there's still some like wonderful questions here that I wanted to give everyone um, a chance to share. Um, and I'm going to start with this one from Christina Bartleson. There are so many different seasons on Clearwater. I did some winter maintenance and I found it to be a very special time with the other crew members. Then there were the education sales and there are other things like pumpkin sale and revival. Um, do any of you have a favorite Thing that clear water does. I have many. Um, how, so if we all try to talk at once, <laughs> Amali, do, uh, do you want us to put our hands up or just jump in? Here, it looks like uh, both you and Betsy have something to say. We can start with you, Kate, if you'd like, and then I'll, sh I'll shoot it over to Betsy. Cool. Okay. This is long, long ago. And uh, in Kingston, it was in when I was first on board in the mid 70s, pumpkin sale was still just being uh, kind of evolving. Communities really didn't know a lot about pumpkin sale. Um, school bus loads of kids were not coming down all organized. It was, it was more or less just families coming by and discovering that there was a boat at the dock, people playing music and there were pumpkins. Um, and I remember just you know the magical moment um, that brought me a little bit of a joy 
joy uh, that after we had unloaded many of the pumpkins through, uh, you know, a regular fire brigade, brigade, brigade of um, pumpkin unloading um, onto the dock. And one of the volunteers was um, painting faces on pumpkins and a young child came up with, with a dime and say, how much are the pumpkins? And that volunteer said, how much do you have? And he says, I have a dime. And so they were able to go home with a pumpkin and just part of the spirit of it was just that moment. So it was a big takeaway for me and, you know, and something that I can share right now that, you know, even as we evolve and as anybody today going out with their child looking for a pumpkin at some kind of a festival might need to have at least a couple dollars in their pocket, but I just appreciated that one moment. Thank you. Uh, Betsy? Um, well, I really appreciated that Joya shared about pumpkin sale because it was really, um, you know, an unforgettable time for a lot of us, but um, I, I want to apologize. I, I had a, a lot of problem with glitchy internet, so I missed a lot of the program, but apparently it's working now. But what your question reminded me of, Amali, was something that we used to do for a period of, I think it was maybe around 12 years, um, was a four-day program with Shoreham Wading River Middle School. And the Shoreham Wading River School District was a school district on Long Island and they had tons of money because there was a nuclear power plant being built there. And the nuclear power plant subsidized the, the school um, district's you know, budget and they were never allowed to open the plant. It never went online, which was probably a good thing. I'm sure Clearwater, like Mana Joe Green would um, agree it was a good thing. Um, and when the, the plant was closed down by, I, I believe, Mario Cuomo, um, they, a lot of funding dry, you know, dried up for that school district. So we stopped sailing with that group. But for about 12 years, we sailed with these, um, like I think sixth grade kids from who had an amazing like prep period to go sailing on the Clearwater because their teachers had taken them camping already. They had taken them, you know, on other expeditions. And when they came to Clearwater, they came, they were so organized. Um, they had coolers full of food for every meal for four days. They camped ashore. They were with us for four days and the crew loved, this was the end of the spring season right before the festival and the crew loved doing Shoreham because we actually got to connect with students for more than 15 minutes in, in a learning station on board the boat. We had these, you know, school-aged children on board for four days and for extended days. They were probably on board for six hours and then we would put them ashore and they did their own thing and then we would pick them up the next day and sail on to someplace else. And I just always remember that as being a really incredible experience because those, those kids were amazing because their teachers were amazing. And no other reason. They're, they were amazing because they had good teachers who cared about them. And they journaled, you know, each day and they, were like, imagine a 12 or 13 year old feeling confident enough to read from their private journal in front of an entire group. But that's what these kids did. And I will never forget, you know, Shore, the Shoreham program, the Shoreham program. And Steve Stan can tell you all about that because I think he's the one that set it up. Um, it was amazing. And I think it was just such a, um, a break in the routine for the crew 
that we loved it because we loved getting to know kids on a, a more, uh, I don't know if intimate's the right word, but you know, like we didn't just have five minutes with them at the tailor. We had, you know, extended periods over the course of days and it was really great to get to know kids on a deeper level. So that, that's my memory. Yeah, I, I actually just wanted to say one thing about um, teachers. Um, Amy put up that picture of us sailing with the um, racial justice, uh, climate justice banners that we sailed with in front of New York. But we had three smaller banners earlier in the year. Um, and one of those ones said pay teachers um, because we really, really, you know, I no value um, the teachers that bring these yep. students with us and even those that don't who, you know, maybe can't. Um, but, you know, we talk to them and, and especially me, um, who's uh, in logistics now and was formerly the educator getting a chance to talk with teachers directly and hearing about all the little things about their students. Um, so I just wanted to echo that uh, support teachers. Um, and then Amy, I know you wanted to respond to that question. Go ahead. Yeah, just really quick. I don't know why this um, that question immediately triggered um, a moment that um, maybe people that are familiar with Clearwater remember that was not that many years ago um, in the grand scheme of things with all these folks around. Um, but it was when the boat was supposed to go to DC and we actually turned around. And um, I think a lot of people were disappointed with that, but I just wanna say that the, the moment that the boat decided to turn around, um, it was a moment that everybody on the boat realized that what the organization and the vessel did and does in the river was too important to sacrifice. And it wasn't worth this other thing. The ed programs that we were running and the amount of kids for two, three hour sales that we did each day at the point of the capacity that we're at, which I think it was, what, 2017 that was, 2018? Um, the capacity of students that we're cranking through our program at that point, it was too valuable to sacrifice because um, the programming was just so important. And I just remember that moment when we turned around that it wasn't, it wasn't worth not having the clear water anymore. Um, so I don't know, that question just triggered that immediately for me. So I just wanted to quickly insert that um, little note of how much we all cared about the, the, the standard programming that we're all doing and how important it is. Mm -hmm. And then I think the next question is kind of similar to some things that we've heard um, already, but I wanted to know, um, well, someone put in the chat, Debbie put in the chat, what was one of the most joyous moments um, you can remember that, that happened when you were the captain of, of the sloop? Um, because I think, you know, in our interviews and in any, you know, the follow-up conversations that we've had, and even in the stories you've told, we've told stories about, you know, things that happened to us um, or um, stories of trial, you know, <laughs> um, or just like a memory that stood out. But was there like a, a joyous moment um, that any of you um, can bring to mind that, that you'd like to share with us? And... Um, Sam, yeah, I was gonna say, I see your hand. Well, it's funny because this is not gonna like, uh, this is gonna step away from sort of the joyousness of the kids, right? The kids are, it's the kids. Um, except for those kids who bought the air horns at Haverstraw Marina, those kids were not joyous. Um, that was not a joy. <laughs> um, this was not, did not involve kids. And Joy, you might've been there. This was an annual gathering or annual meeting at, um, Nori Point, which like sometimes has enough water and sometimes doesn't. And I was, I would think I was mate. Uh, and we stayed just a little bit too long and we got stuck. And we couldn't, we had to get to Poughkeepsie because I think we had programs the next day in Poughkeepsie. And we, we uh, I think I remember coming come to Joy when I, when I started warming up the engine and I'm like, uh, Blix, I think I see, I think we got some mud going on back there. And uh, uh, we ended up having, you know, it was a annual gathering, there were tons of people and we had to get going. And we had, um, it, we, we had a bunch of people, we, you know, we were hung up at the stern, right? So 
we kind of just had to, you know, we had, it's kind of had to get, like if we could just get a, a little bit of space there, uh, we could do it. So we probably had like 30, 35 people out in the bow net, um, jumping up and down all as one. And I was, Joy, were you calling it? Tuesday, he and you know the bowsprit going up and 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 uh, you know Joy's got a like maybe one or two people on the tiller and we couldn't take everybody like once we got gone we had to you know we had to like hightail it up and so it was one of those like you know when when we say we're gone if you don't want you don't want to ride to Poughkeepsie then you better hightail it and so it was this like this moment that sort of stretched out in slow mo um, of you know, who, 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 and we're up enough and, you know, hard right and off we go. And if you're getting off, you're getting off. And like half the people come back on the thing and half the people come like scrambling, running like, you know, onto the, onto the dock, which was not a very big, you know, like bridging the gap. And it was, you know, it was like this sort of kind of explosion of craziness. And we got out of there and it was like, and I think we might have ended up taking a couple of people who weren't meant to come with us, but they didn't seem to mind. So that was just that that sort of moment, that explosion of like, we did it, we're out of here. And then the, the, the people who were like, they're out of here, I gotta get going. So it, it was just that visceral sort of woo. Uh, that was hilarious. Later was hilarious too, when we got to Pierce. So, so many things that are funny later on. Uh, does anyone else have a moment of joy that they'd like to share? Betsy, go ahead and unmute. Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking of a couple different moments and, um, but I'm gonna share one of them. Um, so I don't remember what year it was during my tenure as captain, but there was a scheduled sale for, um, staff members from the office to come out on board the sloop and we were supposed to go from Poughkeepsie to Ryancliffe and so people could catch the train from Ryancliffe back to Poughkeepsie to get their car and then could be on their way but whoever scheduled this I don't think they had considered the tides because we weren't you know we 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 sailed a bit but um we ended up having to lower sail and turn on the engine to get to Ryan Cliff in time for people to catch a certain train. But I had um, the longtime, you know, executive director on board, John Mylod, and he's like, Betsy, let's let's drop the trawl net here. And it was literally, um, you know, south of Ryan Cliff at a point called Sturgeon Point. And it wasn't anywhere we would normally trawl because um, when, and I know that Clearwater doesn't always trawl now, it's, you know, it's um, an environmentally sensitive issue, but, um, you know, that would be the first thing you did when you left the dock before you raised sail because you trawled under engine power. And this Sturgeon Point is nowhere near any dock they were to sailed from you know it's it's too far from Kingston or Ryan Cliff or Poughkeepsie and we but we set the trawl net and I skirted this line that was like around the 25 foot depth mark and we pulled up the trawl and I had 21 short nose sturgeon in the net and Greg Swansea, who was the first captain I ever sailed with, my first day as a volunteer, and then he got off and Peg Brandon jumped on, but <laughs> he said, oh my God, Betsy, that's the most sturgeon I've ever seen in the net. And that was, that was joyous for me. And of course, we just released all those sturgeon. Um, you know, they were like, yay big, like, um, you know, a couple feet long, if that, and, but that was, that was a joyous moment. That was a joyous moment, catching all the sturgeon, knowing that they're under, they're there, they're there. There is so much life in the river and we just can't see it because our eyes are clouded because the river does that, you know, and there is so much amazing life 
below the surface of the water that I just, I wholeheartedly believe, you know, the river is its own living being. It's its own, you know, organism. And that was just a really happy moment for me to like come up with all those sturgeon. So Betsy, I'm going to let you know that we do still fish, although not off of Sturgeon Point, because we don't want that to happen. Um, <laughs> we do not want to catch Sturgeon in our net, but we do still go fishing on almost every sale. Anytime that we don't go fishing, it's usually because the students are late. And then that's the first thing, you know, that we would cut um, so we can get to the entire egg program. Um, but yeah, that's I mean, cool. I, I agree, you know, so much. I think for me, one of the most rewarding parts, and I know this isn't about me, but I'm just going to say it anyway, that, you know, it's that moment of, of recognition when students or, or even adults come on board and we're explaining to them, like, dirt does not mean dirty or like brown and, and clear, though that has no, you know, connection to each other on, on what it means for the river to be a healthy ecosystem. Um, and so I just, again, every time you, I just want to echo everything that you say. Um, thank you, thank you. I have two more questions and um, they're both from the chat. And again, this is open to everyone. Um, this is from Anonymous. What would you recommend to women who would like to get involved in sailing and, and gain experience? Anyone wanna take that one? Kate? I think that um, um, there's, been a, there's been a theme that I've heard from each of our stories that um, sometimes it just takes showing up and um, maybe asking questions directly, maybe um, asking questions of, of certain people who are ready to hear the questions. Um, you know, and I, you know, from those who heard my talk last week is, um, I feel like I was at a different time and place and that I, hoped that I had helped um, helped um, make, make it a little bit easier, at least on the decks of the Clearwater for other women to, you know, follow, follow me in that um, because of Clearwater's culture of being open for helping, uh, you know, like Amy, your story was great that you were, you showed up and people <laughs> there said, great, you're the new engineer even before you had had your interview, and uh, and I feel like that was the same with me. I got a telegram to say, "Okay, you're the new captain." Wait a minute, I didn't have an interview, um, but um, so looking for places that are open and um, and also just um, being open in yourselves to finding a mentor, finding people who are ready to um, help give you um, and you find those opportunities to find some time to learn learn the trade, learn the skills, um, whatever size of boat it is. And I have to say that, you know, I started out on a large boat. I didn't jump into small boats until much later. And I'm really grateful for all my outward bound experience on my 30 foot open boats where, you know, I got to learn a lot more about small boat or relatively small boat handling um, in that world. Um, from the larger boats, but I think that any any size and any population of people can be a starting point. So I don't want to name any organizations specifically. I think it's it's a mutual sort of a mutual pact of wanting to learn and finding people will give you a chance. Amy, I think a way for a lot of um, younger women or um, people trying to get into the industry um, to be able to do so is for the elder women and other people in positions of power to support those women. I think once we have women who are supporting other women, we can have a um, industry that is non-exclusive and inclusive. And I think it's important to recognize people's gender or whether whatever it may be in that and support it and be a mentor. I don't think it necessarily has to be people crawling up the ladder. I think people on the top of the ladder should offer a hand and help people up it. Definitely, Betsy. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, for me, like I was somebody that from like the time I was like five years old, I grew up with a chip on my shoulder because I saw so much discrimination against females. You know, I, I was told I could not play play little league baseball, even though I felt like I could play better pitch and catch than my older brother could. And um, so, and, and in some ways, you know, having a chip on my shoulder held me back because I wasn't open to everyone that might have tried to help me along the way. But I really feel like it's important for if, if you're a female and looking to advance and, and yes, you know, the same can be said for nine non-binary people look for role models look for role models in those positions of leadership um who will support you all along the way you know i had that support at clearwater i was so lucky to have that you know support at clearwater because i had kay cronin i had peg brandon i had beth doxy all came before me and just paved the way. And by the time I got there, it wasn't even a big deal any longer. You know, at least not at Clearwater, maybe other places, but I just feel like find, if you want to advance in your career, find role models, established role models, because you can be barking up the wrong tree in so many places if they're not accepting and and you're going to be frustrated and you're going to want to like sue them maybe rightfully but don't you know don't waste your energy don't waste your time there's a lot of good organizations that want to hire female captains and find 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 good mentors find find that kate conan out there find her because i found her <laughs> she came to me but i found her just the same right yeah, I just want to shameless plug. I mean, I know this night is about clear water, and I think that the clear water community has this wonderful space, obviously, to to foster the growth of, of women in leadership positions, especially those um, on the boat. Um, but I also want to remind everyone that, you know, this event is being hosted by the National Women's Sailing Association. There is no, you know, distinction in the kind of boat um, or the kind of sailor that you are. Um, so please go to uh, the National Women's Sailing Associ Association website. It's womensailing.org. Check them out on Facebook. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Women Who Sail, but it is a global community of women. It's a private group of women um, who can share and commiserate and support each other on Facebook. Um, that is over 17,000 members strong. Um, and so there's, you know, there's also subgroups for any uh, people that, you know, want people that are closer to them to connect with. So whether you're looking for someone that's regional um, or on the same continent as you or someone that specifically uh, sails tall ships, there's a women who sail tall ships group. Um, there's also a women who sail women of color group because, you know, being a woman is, is one thing and being able to see all of these women here and identify with them and love them. You know, when I was a kid, there were no, well, not, I'm not gonna say there were no, but I'm going to say that, you know, I did not see black women on boats. Um, and so that was kind of a leap I had to take out for myself. And so one, um, one of the things that I, I say about wanting to be on the boat and my kind of like existential crisis with wanting to be the educator versus um, wanting to work in the off office is that, you know, I have had teachers pull me aside and say like, I'm really glad that you're here. You know, I didn't know if my, you know, students of color would be able to relate to anyone on the crew or if anyone on the crew would get us. Um, and so that is, you know, a really important thing. So definitely, you know, check out those groups, support those groups. Um, there are really wonderful communities of women out there if you're looking as a woman or someone who identifies as a woman um, for support. Uh, women who sail also, you know, accepts those who are non-binary. Um, I said at the, at the Tall Ships America conference, um, 
if you are a woman um, or if you are not, or if you feel like you don't identify as a woman, but you think the group is for you, then it is for you. So NWSA, Women Who Sail, Clearwater, there are so many different uh, groups and organizations out there. Um, I just want everyone uh, to know ab about them and, and to check them out. Um, Sam, I know you had one more comment you wanted to add. I just, it's just something Betsy said made me think of this. I ended up having to do uh, being captain for one of the young men at the helm just because something came up. And I just want to remind every, everyone that you're as much of a role model to boys seeing seeing you in positions uh, like this as we are to girls. And it, it shifts their minds oh, yes. as well. And I had I had boys when I ended up doing that young men at the helm. Um, I don't remember what, what had happened. Um, but I had the boys saying to me, you're the first person, you're the first woman that I've seen in a position of power is not my mom. Um, and that's like crazy. And I was like, oh, let's get crazy. Um, so it, it, was, <laughs> it was great. I mean, and the boys were, I mean, I love, they, they were awesome. They're my boys, they were great. Um, but it just, it shifted something in me where it was like, that, that sort of, maybe we should do a young men at the helm was like, oh, this is why we're doing this. So, you know, the reach goes beyond what you imagine it to be. So the boys, the boys need to, it's good for them to see us. So I have a few things to, to wrap up with, which are that uh, one, the first episode of She Sailor Sea Story Sloop Clearwater is now available on the Clearwater Facebook page and on womensailing.org if you're a member there. Um, so you can go and check it out and hear Kate and Betsy and Cindy share their stories. Um, the other thing is that we are talking so much about what Clearwater does today and, and we do some other things too. Um, so if you live in New York or you visit New York and you are one of those people that has that response like, oh, if we touch the water, are we gonna grow a third arm? Um, no, you're not. You know, there's so many different um, things that have that have gone on in the valley, including Clearwater's presence and and decades long work that have made the river swimmable and fishable. Um, and if you have questions about whether you can fish or whether you can eat the fish, Clearwater has a fish advisory, um, and Meg's going to pop that up on the screen now. And so a lot of that is uh, determined by your gender um, and your age. Um, so if you're more interested in, in hearing about the fish advisory, um, check this out. Please go to the Clearwater website. Please support our youth empowerment programs. Young Women at the Helm is, is the, the crown and the, or the jewel in the crown of Clearwater. Um, and, and unfortunately we had to miss it last year. Um, and so this year we are planning to get back to our youth empowerment program. So please, please support us. Um, we are in the planning um, stages now. It's best to start early. Um, I'm gonna touch on what Amy said. We are gonna try to go to the Long Island Sound again this summer. So please follow us on all social media pages at Sloop Clearwater. Please keep up with what we're doing. Um, we've done so much great work virtually in the last year. Um, Amy mentioned the Our River Connects Us campaign, um, which garnered over 400,000 uh, impressions on social media. So we are, um, we're doing it all. Um, we're keeping the things traditional and we're moving forward into the future. Um, and so I just wanted to thank our speakers again. Um, you were all so, so wonderful um, and so inspiring and so legendary that I'm really, really glad that you gave us the opportunity to um, share your experience with people and, and to get your faces back out in front of um, this group of people who may not have um, known you before. Um, and I'm not gonna ask anyone to answer this question because someone put it in the chat, but it's more of an existential question. Um, what, if anything, do all six captains have in common? And I think that is just like being wonderful, fearless ladies who are just like willing to take on the world. Um, and so I don't know that there's like one characteristic, um, you know, in particular, but I think that you're all um, really wonderful and really amazing. And thank you for being here with us tonight. We not fearless. <laughs> Remember, mine was all about um, terrifying moments. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and but you got through them though, right? 
with a and, lot and of you took the leap and you became a captain and so that in and of itself is a revolutionary act to me at least own the fear yes <laughs> clear water is what we all have in common well it's amazing and <laughs> clear water there it is and people presenting challenges to us to for our learning yeah yeah okay. i could Thank say you. i could say so i could say something else go ahead Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were in the call, but you know, to be honest, you know, there is such a strong uh, uh, relationship we have with our shipmates. And, you know, I would do anything for any of these women. And I've sailed with all of them except for Amy, but I know Amy. Um, I would do. I would do absolutely anything. I would go to the ends of the earth for any of them. That's what we have in common. Yeah, I mean, just the support and the love and the and the just yeah. being the backbone, each other's backbone. Anytime um, yeah. someone needs it, that's definitely one of the things that everyone. If we could all show up as volunteers next season. Yes, I would love to for do pumpkin sale. Women pumpkin sale. We'll do pumpkin sale. <laughs> all right thank you I'm end it there. thank you so much thank you to bridget who's been in the chat thank you to meg who's been our back behind the scenes producer i really appreciate all of you i couldn't have done it without you um i'll thank see you all tomorrow thank you. <laughs> thank you good night